Since the last video, I've been hard at work installing the Sledgehammer Electric Turbo on the LTD. And by the way, Wasps decided to take up residence. This is my Wasp killer here in the garage somewhere. But I wanted to give you a really quick tour of how I installed the thing into the car. So let's go around to the back of the LTD here. You can see the two battery packs right now held in place with this janky uh, bungee cord, but there will be a proper mount when we take it to the track. The control box is here. Uh, lithium iron phosphate battery is here. This is a board that interfaces with the car's computer and is one of the things that actually triggers the electric turbo. By the way, the ESC is mounted all the way up here on the rear package tray with neodymium magnets. It's not going anywhere. I could literally bend this thing. It's just not gonna move. These cables are still a little long. I'll, you know, shorten them up once I figure everything out. So in the control box here, you'll notice this little knob. This little knob sets the maximum power. And this is where we had it set yesterday. It's set to about 75%. We'll know the actual amount once I pull the data log from the ESC, but you know, somewhere in that ballpark, but we still have that much more to go. And of course you can set it for less. So if you look all the way back there, you will see the motor cables coming out of the back of the ESC. Let's follow them around and work our way up front. And the motor cables, welcome to the interior of the LTD. And the motor cables run down here. I didn't want to put them in with the other cables because everything else is down inside here. But A, these are really thick. There's a lot of them. There just happens to be a natural sort of, I guess, reinforcing divot right there. It's just the perfect spot to keep everything away and sort of out of the way. Moving on up. Not to the east side. So here we are in the front. There's just a bunch of extra wires hanging out here that I haven't connected yet. This is for uh, current sensor here, which obviously I'd have to run to the back. Uh, this was the old control cable for the ESC that immolated itself, a USB cable for the Mega Squirt. A lot of people ask how I tune the car. Well, that's how I tune the car. It's got plenty of outputs. It data logs to an SD card, greatest thing ever. Uh, once you get it installed and working, that is. Uh, it does have some issues, but they have long since been resolved. So these are this is the control panel down here. The big thing is the that turns on and activates the electric turbo. Another thing that people don't seem to understand is the power glide. Uh, it's a two-speed transmission, a 180 low and a one-to-one -one high. It's just two speeds, but when you have this much power, that's really all you need. Um, in fact, more gears would just take more time and end up in more tire smoke, as we'll find out later why. This is the trans brake button. A trans brake engages reverse and first gear at the same time. And when you get off it, when you release the trans brake, then it releases reverse and the car leaves like it's been rear-ended by a semi. So going back to the commentary about, well, that's dumb, it's only two gears. Well, that may be true if this was a 300 horsepower or less engine, but well, clearly it's not. This is a Dart Iron Eagle Sportsman based 8.2 deck small block Ford, uh, heavily ported trick flow twisted wedge heads. That intake used to say trick flow on it, but now it just says trick because we cut 11 pounds of aluminum out of it and shortened it and tuned it and obviously long tube headers and well, you get the idea. It's a pretty potent mill. It's also built for boost. It's around just under nine to one compression. But here are the motor cables. They come out and wait, what's this? Thar she blows exactly where I left it yesterday. Everything is fine. It's well mounted. It doesn't move. I can move the car. Uh, this is a blow off valve, which you need when you lift off because this thing is still spinning, although it's decelerating but that opens up and just takes any load off the impeller. One other thing I quickly wanted to mention, these tires are no joke. They're 275-40ZR17. They have a good amount of tread on them. I mean, this, this is a big tire. Uh, and these are no match, even with a 308 rear gear for the power that this engine makes with the sledgehammer on it. I knew that going in, I knew that we would have major traction issues even at relatively high speeds, but we needed to know whether all the computers are talking to each other, this thing activates properly, it just works well and everything else. 
And, you know, I stayed in it as long as I could, which turned out not to be very long, but we know it works. And after this, the plan is to take it to the dyno. So without further ado, let's go ahead and cut to the two seconds of good old American freedom, which I have a thousand camera angles of, although I didn't want to put anybody in any kind of harm's way. So a lot of them are from a good distance. And then after that, we're going to look at the data and what we actually saw. Now that I've milked those two seconds about as long as humanly possible, let's look at the data. So this is the data log from the mega squirt in the car. The green trace is the throttle position. The white trace is engine RPM. The red trace up here is boost. The yellow trace is uh, air fuel. And down below, the white trace is map, but in kilopascals. And uh, the yellow trace is duty cycle that's on the injectors it's got pretty big injectors in this car uh, and then you have timing and green and then the red line down here is mat or manifold air temperature so going back to the top graph uh, you can see right around where the this vertical teal line is is where we hit zero psi that's up here zero psi and why that's important is because we know from previous data that the electric turbo presents almost exactly a one PSI boost restriction. So it's like minus one PSI when it's not spinning. So it looks like I engaged the electric turbo. It's set to trigger at 80% throttle and over 3000 RPM. We were over 3000 RPM the whole time. 80% throttle probably is somewhere right around here, I guess. Uh, so you can tell that we were only running the electric turbo for less than two seconds, definitely, probably around 1.7, 1.8 seconds. Now it's important to note that the ESC in the electric turbo has a two and a half second spool up time programmed into it. As we get more comfortable with it, we'll be able to reduce that number fairly significant, probably hopefully down to around one second ramp up time. So this red line, you can see where it stops being a restriction and starts adding horsepower. Now you're only looking at 5.4 PSI peak boost. Well, again, the electric turbo was not set to run at max speed. Plus, it was still spooling up by the time the tires broke traction. And if you look at the white line engine RPM, you can see where that happened. It's right here where things started to go haywire. It doesn't look as violent as it is. You can see in the video inside the car how violent it actually was, how it jerks me around. But uh, this is, appears a little softer here simply because of the torque converter in the power glide. So another thing that's worth noting is we only saw a maximum of 5,471 RPM. The engine in the car makes peak power at pretty much exactly 6,000 RPM naturally aspirated. With this uh, electric turbo on it, it probably will go up a few hundred RPM, but you know, we weren't even at max RPM. Now, a, a lot of people are always like, oh, five PSI, that's nothing. Well, there's, there's a couple of things that you got to keep in mind. Number one, there's no losses here. This is like pure, perfect boost. It's totally lossless. There's no belt driving it. There's no pumping losses from turbos, none of that. So this 5.4 PSI, based on my experience and our initial dyno tests, I've had four or five different forced induction systems on this car over the years going back into the 90s and I can tell you with absolute certainty this is twice as efficient as the Whipple that was on the car before. So this is more like almost 11 pounds of Whipple boost at 5.4 pounds here, which is a win on every level because it makes it easier to tune. You make a lot more power. It doesn't impart heat into the uh, intake charge, which is a good reason to take a look at this red line down here. You can see it actually cools off because unlike a traditional turbo or even a supercharger, they're constantly hot because they're constantly spinning and of course a turbo just shares a common hunk of metal with the exhaust i mean it's going to get hot we don't have that issue here in fact it functions as a heat sink we probably are never going to need to intercool this thing and the most vital thing to note even though the electric turbo isn't spooled up even though we're not at peak rpm even though the maximum power knob on the electric turbo itself was uh, not even set to max 
we still managed to make 672 to 683 flywheel horsepower, depending on how you calculate it. That number is fairly accurate, uh, and you can derive that from the brake-specific fuel consumption based on the duty cycle. Or another way to, to figure it out is simply, I know exactly how much power the engine makes naturally aspirated, and then you can do the math based on pressure and percentages of atmospheric. But anyway, that, that's a good number, 672 to 683. So let's look at the data from the actual ESC itself. So this first chart shows you watts, and yes, it's showing you correctly 26,000 watts. Just a hair over 26 kilowatts. That is a lot of power. That is over 30 horsepower. It's probably close to like 34 ish or so you can divide watts by 746 and find out how much horsepower it is there's a direct correlation so if we get rid of that so we can start zooming in and seeing some of the graphs at the bottom this next one where you see this yellow trace here this is amps so we're about 465 ish amps and you know and that's, that's where the power is coming from it's a tremendous amount of power now let's take a look at this this green trace here this green trace is the impeller RPM, the motor RPM speed, actually. It's direct drive, so is there a direct relationship? Uh, we hit just over 28,000 impeller RPM, which, you know, I know a lot of people are commenting who don't really understand, you know, compressor maps and all that. Well, isn't that too slow for a turbo? Well, it depends on the exducer size and the inducer size, and this is actually technically a Vortex supercharger, so its impeller RPM is much lower than, say, a tiny turbo you'd find like on a Volkswagen or something. Uh, this is this needs a lot less RPM, but it needs a lot more power to drive it, obviously. So we're about 28,300 RPM, which is a little bit more than we saw uh, at this equivalent RPM with the first version that went, uh, you know, like 10 fives at 127 or something. And again, this isn't even close to max power yet. So let's keep going down the graphs and expanding them. So this red trace here, this faint red trace, is actually the throttle input request. So this is where I had the knob set, right over 85%, it's probably 85.2. And you can tell that it was only active for roughly two seconds, and out of that two seconds, about half of it is ramp up time from the Arduino that controls it. So we can actually shorten this up a good bit, um, especially based on that, that current graph where we didn't see any significant spikes of any sort but for now we're playing it kind of safe so again two and a half seconds spool up time is what's programmed into the esc and this was like not even two seconds really or about two seconds of spool up time so we still have another you know 25 percent to go um as well as more power now let's take a look at voltage. That's what this orange graph here is. This is battery voltage. You can see how we started at about 62 volts. Maximum for the ESC is 63. And the voltage sag as the current draw goes up drops it down to about 55 volts. And then when it shuts off, it pops right back up. Now this part here, this sort of ski slope looking part of the curve, this is where the capacitors are discharging. And this is exactly why a number of people have commented on why don't you use supercapacitors to power this thing? This is why I don't. Uh, not only is their power density like ridiculously low, but their discharge curve is almost perfectly linear when it comes to voltage. So voltage is what defines RPM in brushless motor world, and this is not what you want to see when you're trying to build horsepower going in the other direction. Lithium technology batteries generally have a pretty flat discharge curve. There's very little voltage drop under load, relatively speaking. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you guys coming along with me on this journey. I'm having a great time doing this. You know, there's been a lot of failures, but there's been a lot of wins, too. I would qualify this as a win. One of the things that makes me chuckle is when somebody leaves a comment, well, what about if you want to be in boost for two or three minutes? You saw what happened after two seconds. Yeah, you're not staying in this thing for even 30 seconds, much less a minute or two. Uh, you do that, well, you're probably not going to be on this planet for very long. Uh, there is a possibility where I may need to pull boost for about 20, 25 seconds. That's if we go to the Texas Mile. There's some life changes coming up for me, which are pretty significant and I'm pretty excited about. So once again, thanks for joining me. Uh, leave a comment. Give me a thumbs up. Go ahead and subscribe. Our next stop is to uh, our good friend Ray at his dyno. We're going to see what kind of power this thing actually puts down in a controlled environment where we can actually at least measure that power. And then after that, we're going to take it to a track. 
stick around. There's going to be a lot more coming up. I'll catch you all in the next one.